hey, welcome to Creative Block. We're your hosts, Jean. And V. We interview people in the animation industry about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We asked people on Twitter if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Alex Hirsch. Hey! What's up? I, Gene, I appreciate your podcast voice. Is Thank that, you. whoa, hey, is that your catchphrase? No. I need a catchphrase. Does he have a catchphrase? I, but whoa, hey, isn't terrible. I, thank you. I customize uh, the intros for our guests. So it's a, it's a artisanal handcrafted <laughs> intro. Oh, thank you um, so much. For, thank you so much for that, whoa, hey. I'll, yeah, it, I'll, yeah, I'll put yeah. it on my mantle. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, amongst all your awards. Alex, tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Alex. And mostly I just waste time on Twitter and order Postmates and wait for the pandemic to end. Yeah. That's 99% of my life. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm best known for uh, being the creator of Shrek. Uh, no, I, I. Oh, wow. Created it. Th thank you. Yes. No, it's, it's based on an actual ogre. I know very well. Didn't no, know that. Wow. I, uh, <laughs> I, I am Alex Hirsch. Um, I work in animation. I created a cartoon show on the Disney Channel called Gravity Falls. Um, I've been a consultant, writer, producer on a number of projects, uh, Mitchell's versus the Machines, uh, Inside Job, which is out now, um, and a bunch of other things I'm probably going to forget. Um, little caveat before we get into it, I'm, I'm getting over a bit of a cold, so if I say anything that makes no sense, blame uh -huh. NyQuil. <laughs> okay, cool. We'll take advantage of that. Um, so, uh... Yeah, give us a little Spark Notes version of your career and how you got into animation and uh, you know your school yeah. Experience. Well, so I mean, I'm <laughs> all that. I feel like I've known so many animators and artists and people in this industry, and and I often ask them the exact same question that you asked me, and I usually get more or less the same answer, which is like, I don't know. It's funny. I talk to people in other fields. You know, I talk to somebody who's in finance or somebody who uh, you know is in music and. And they say, oh, I thought I wanted to be this, or I thought I wanted to be that. And when I talk to animators, it, it tends to seem like this almost calling right. that just like they, they pop out of the womb with a pencil and a ravenous need to express themselves with drawing. So, <laughs> so usually the origin story yep. is like clouded in like the murkiness of like early childhood of just like, oh, I, I was bad at everything else and this brought me joy and I decided to cling to it like a life raft and do nothing else and now suddenly I'm an adult and I'm questioning all my choices. But yeah, I mean, it's it's the same thing. It's like, you know, I remember so many of my earliest memories are like, like maybe my actual first, literal first memory is like being like a baby, mm -hmm. like in a shag carpet with like green carpet fibers, like, you know, like towering over me and looking up at a television playing the Fantasia sequence of the T-Rex attacking the Triceratops mm -hmm. and being like, like, this is my creation myth. Like I'm not religious, but I am seeing cartoon dinosaurs mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm baptized in the glow of this television. And as I be, you know, <laughs> gain the ability to speak and walk, I will continue to orbit this glowing cartoon like a moth around a flame. You know, uh, I think when I was in elementary school, it was like the nineties. So it was sort of the first Disney, uh, you know, first post seventies Disney Renaissance. And, you know, I was obsessed with, you know, I was obsessed with Mickey Mouse. I loved Aladdin. Um, and I was really into comic strips. Like, uh, I was really into mm -hmm. Calvin and Hobbes. I was obsessed with Calvin and Hobbes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was obsessed with the Simpsons. And just as far as I could tell, the real world was scary oh, and yeah. cold and gray and angry and cartoons were fun and delightful and made sense. And I could relate to them. Um, and you know, as, as early as I can remember the idea of wanting to be something was I, oh, I want to make comic strips just like mm -hmm. Calvin and Hobbes. And then, and then I got into middle school and The Simpsons became my entire role. It's like, oh, I want to be Matt Groening. I want to make a cartoon show. Um, and uh, I, I got lucky enough that a friend told me about um, the California State Summer School for the Arts, CESA, uh, animation summer program when I was in high school. Oh, nice. um, and I applied to that program and I got in and it was like a complete life changer because mm. I went from being in high school, you know, you're like the one or two people in your class who can draw. And then suddenly I went to animation uh, camp and everyone could draw way better than me. And I was like, oh, man, I thought I was good. I'm way behind. I'm going to, you know, I came back for junior and senior year of high school. And I was like, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop going outside. I'm going to stop playing video games. I'm going to stop having hobbies. I'm going to stop making eye contact with people. I'm only going to work on my portfolio. And like, this is it. This is my life calling. I need to get better. And yeah, uh, you know, applied to CalArts, made a film every year, made a bunch of amazing friends, had the best, best, best time at college. Like 
I really had just like a, you know, magical Hogwarts college experience. And so many of my friends who I was like, oh, I think this guy's a genius. Um, but, you know, everyone thinks that about their best friend in college. It's like, no, my friend was Penn Ward. He went to make Adventure Time. Mm-hmm. My friend was Adrian Molina. He went to go direct Coco. Um, like, like I got really lucky in my Cal Arts class that I would just happened to be there at a generation with some really, really extraordinary uh, talented mm-hmm. creators. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, I literally like oh I, I, if I, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons it's with Pat McHale and wow he's got really cool unique drawings it's like oh this guy goes on to create over the garden wall no it, it, there's there's sort of a weird secret who's who of future brilliant nerds that I just I worship my friends at CalArts it's like they're so good does anyone else notice this um, <laughs> and uh, it's been this amazing thing watching so many of them go on to do such incredible things but um, after CalArts I did the uh, Pixar apprenticeship. Um, and I did the story training program and it was really, really fun. Uh, but I, I was really impatient. Um, I think I've always been super impatient. I, I, I get really excitable and really enthusiastic and I just kind of want to make something immediately. And I kind of, any obstacle in my way, I try to see if there's a shortcut. And I remember being at Pixar, it, it was, I, I, I really loved the training program, but then I talked to a few friends who had graduated a few years before me to see like, wow, you work at Pixar. You did this training pro- pro- program. You were offered the job. You, you know, you won the reality show. You, you stayed on the Survivor Island, and now you're at Pixar. What are you doing? What's your job? Uh, and I remember one of them. One of them was uh, they were working on Wally, and in the original version of Wally, I guess in the first animatic, uh, the humans that were in the spaceship didn't have noses, mm-hmm. um, but they, they're like humans had evolved to be blobs that were noseless, and but then they changed the story. They're like, oh, actually, they, they should have noses. They should be human. So. There was a board artist who was just adding noses to thousands of storyboards. Yeah. His entire job was just drawing noses. And I was like, you were one of the best artists yeah. in Cal Arts. And your whole job is drawing noses. And then I talked to another artist who his entire job was he was working on up and he was just coloring in the balloons. Like so they, they had an animatic screen for the executives and the executives were like, <laughs> you don't really get the fun of these balloons unless they're in color. So this guy was just spending like weeks and weeks just coloring in balloons. Oh, no. And I was like- They're the, the best balloons though. Yeah, well, I just had this feeling of like, Pixar's amazing, but I'm too impatient to draw noses and colored balloons. Like I want to make a cartoon now. I want to write dialogue. Um, I, I want to come up with characters. Um, so I, I didn't yeah. take the Pixar offer and I went to work on a show called Flapjack mm. um, because Flapjack had all these all these Cal Arts classmates that I had looked up to, Penn Ward, Pat McHale, J.G. Quintel, Sambalai's iPhone, uh, Thurf Van Orman, um, like all these guys that I went to school with that I thought were amazing. And they said, you could come here and write stories and come up with characters and write dialogue. And I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, worked at Flapjack for a little bit, uh, started doing some, it took a few development meetings, did one with Disney. Um, they asked if I had any show ideas. Uh, I came up with a couple show ideas in a weekend, pitched them to Disney. Disney liked the ideas. Uh, I had a second meeting with them where they said, we like, we like one of these ideas more than the other. I, I stayed up all night and did a bunch of storyboards and pitched them. <laughs> I went to a, a seafood restaurant um, with Eric Coleman and, and Mike Moon. And they, I, I, I pushed the, the breadsticks and the fish like off the table and plunked down a bunch of Gravity Falls storyboards that I'd stayed up all night and done that night and pitched them Dipper and Mabel like the first time I'd ever pitched anyone that I mean, I'd sort of come up with them that night. Um, and they were really impressed with that pitch and they offered me an overall deal to come to Disney to develop stuff. So I left Flapjack and then while I was on the overall deal, they said, if you help us develop something on our end, we'll help you develop your Gravity Falls concept. I helped them develop fish hooks. Fish hooks got greenlit. They asked if I would run fish hooks. I said, it wasn't my idea. I feel uncomfortable running someone else's show, although I'm really excited to be mm-hmm. 24 and have someone tell me to run my own show, but I don't think I should run fish hooks. Um, please let me develop Gravity Falls. They said, okay, I yeah. developed it. It got greenlit. Uh, and then the remainder of my 20s was a, just a, a blur <laughs> of just doing nothing but Gravity Falls. Um, and I, I gave it everything and hired all the people that I thought were coolest and said, all right, doors open. I'm finally making my own cartoon. Let me bring everyone I think is cool who hasn't already been hired by another one of my friends into the building. Let's work our asses off. Let's try to make the best thing we possibly can. Um, and then uh, when Gravity Falls was over, I slept for a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> As you should. Yes. <laughs> um, and since then, I've been uh, working uh, on a number of different projects, some announced, some unannounced, and I'm currently uh, an overall deal at Netflix, uh, where I'm a producer on a few projects. Uh, Inside Job is the first one of the projects I'm a producer on to to come out, um, and I'm currently working on uh, an untitled Alex Search project, 
where I'm free from the shackles of Disney mm-hmm. uh, and now have the freedom to make the most insane thing I could possibly imagine. Uh, and uh, maybe it'll be great. Maybe it will collapse under the weight of its own psychotic ambition. That will be up for the audience to decide. Uh, and then I got a little a little cold um, and I'm, o- I'm getting over the cold and now I'm here talking to you guys. Wow. That is amazing. I love how concise that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just filled a machine gun with words and shot it at your guys' face. No, that no, was call- super great because like, there's a couple things that I, I was like, really um, like, what's the word? Like, not surprised, but like impressed, I guess. This is like, how did you kind of like know in high school how to uh, kind of make your portfolio to the standards of what CalArts was. I know you took the class, but kind of how did you kind of go about like drawing at that time? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the honest truth is that I, when I was at the CISA summer program for the arts, I met this guy named Austin Madison. Um, and Austin was a fellow 16 year old who could draw like a mad magazine artist from like the 60s. Like he could draw like, an adult animator who'd been animating for decades and he was my age. And I was, I, I thought at the time I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm good for a 16 year old. Like I, like how could anyone possibly be better than me at this age? Because all I do is draw. So mm-hmm. surely no one could possibly, and I didn't know it was possible to be that good that young. Um, and as soon as I saw Austin Madison's drawings, um, it, you know, over the summer and I came back to my high school, it was like, I was like, Oh my God, like, mm-hmm. like, like I can draw like one or two or three of my own original cartoon characters from a three quarters view. I suck at hands. I can't draw cars. This guy can draw hands, vehicles, <laughs> horses, dinosaurs from any angle. God, horses. Yeah, yeah. He, could, he could draw them from different angles and different styles. I can do one thing kind of badly. And so I like, I was just like, okay, crap. Uh, I, I remember like going on to, you know, this is the days of like dial up internet and AOL instant messenger. Like mm-hmm. I was looking for PDFs of like Andrew Loomis, how to do like, uh, you know, like old illustrators from the 30s, like how to, you know, how, how to draw realistic human forms for advertising. And I was just like frame by framing every piece of animation I had and just like meticulously copying and then doing figure drawing and then doing life drawing and just like, just trying to like level up my stats in every single category um, <laughs> because I, I didn't, I thought my stats were good and I realized they were total garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I still barely, barely got it. Like I was on the wait list um, like, you know, if, if some, if, if, if some kid hadn't, uh, you know, I don't know, had to take a sabbatical year or something, I would not have been in that year. Um, like I, I was never the best draftsman. Um, like to me, sort of drawing was the, the tool to entertain, but drawing itself was always like challenging for me. I wasn't amazing at it. Um, so it, it, I just threw the kitchen sink at it, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 totally. And the, you're actually touching on something that I wanted to ask you as well. Sure. So like you um talk a lot about like drawing and going to cal arts and everything but you your career ended up being more one of a writer right yeah totally. yeah and how did you kind of flex that muscle because in the story that you told it's you we hear mostly about drawing um obviously you watch yeah. a lot of cartoons but there's got to be more to that right yeah, uh, here, I'm trying to add to your guys' beautiful board. We got yes. one, one Alex there, Doodle. There he is. Um, these, are all, these are all amazing, by, by the way. This, this, this frog suit gets a shining gold star. This is, this is Thank you. Phenomenal. We got good um, prompts. Yeah, well, so that, honestly, uh, that's a great question, and that really sort of was a turning point for me, which was, like, I... I always really loved writing um, and in middle school and high school, like my favorite class was English. Whenever we would have a a creative assignment or a free write prompt, like I remember we had this teacher in seventh grade who didn't seem to want to be teaching. So she would, we had English at 9 a.m. and she would just give us every day, like of our, of our like hour long class, like 40 minutes of it was a free write. She would just play Enya Pure Mood soundtrack. um, And like, we would listen to the Enya Pure Mood soundtrack and just do a, a free write on any topic. She would just say like, oh, the topic is, uh, what do you want your future to be like? Uh, the topic is come up with a story about a guy who's scared. And every morning we would just have to fill pages until 40 minutes was up while she just like read magazines or whatever and ate Starbucks. And 
Everybody else in the class thought it was a total bullshit assignment. People were like, this class fucking sucks. Like, we're wasting our time. And I was like, no, that's yeah. Every, yeah, getting up every morning and just writing anything. I was in heaven. I had so much fun. Um, and, yeah. like, I just, like, really, really loved writing assignments. And I really loved, like, I was always trying to write, um, like, I love. I was always, always trying to, like, write rhymes. Like, I really liked, um, I was obsessed with, like, cartoon show theme songs. And I would, like, write my own parodies of theme songs. Mm. Um, like, I was just, like, always trying to write funny things and, like, write rhymes and jokes um and uh so like that was always a thing that i love to do in a focus and i also i there was this like competitive improv program i did oh. um in, in in middle school and high school that i did with a, like a team of friends um where like it, you it was it, it's hard to explain but you would come up with this performance that you would do every year this kind of like this big skit that you would perform in competition with other teams yeah but then there was also a a, a percentage of the of the process that was uh, that was improvised and sometimes they were just these word games like literally they'd get you in a circle, you and your improv team of seven, and there'd be these weird judges, and the judges would be like, think of, like, think of different kinds of rocks, as many as you can, as fast as you can, in a circle, go, you've got 15 minutes, we're judging you for creativity. Um, so it would be like, you could say an igneous rock, or you could say cement, or you could say a, a, a rock star, or, or uh, you could say uh, a, like a rolling stone gathers no moss. Like it was this bizarre free association word game stuff, but you were literally judged on how quickly you could think of like riffs on a word. Mm -hmm. um, like, so I was like, I was just doing all these weird word games and stuff. Like I taught myself how to speak backwards was I, when I was in sixth grade. Ah, uh, nice. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> Can you still do that? Uh, God, no. Uh, and I wasn't great at it then. But so like words always were something I had like a great like fluency with. And like, even like when I was really young, I was like obsessed with reading mm. like anything. Like, like the first book I ever read was, uh, uh, I think Through the Looking Glass. And I was just like so mesmerized by the fact yeah. that there were like riddles and acrostics and like poems and puns and stuff. So like, I was always like very verbal. Um, but then, but then I, I loved animation, so I tried to teach myself to draw. And, and when I went to CalArts, I was like, I'm gonna try to become the best artist I possibly can. And for freshman year and sophomore year, all I did was like, try to get better at drawing, try to get better at drawing, try to get better at drawing. And my, I sucked as an animator. Like I did not have the consistency of form necessary from pose to pose to pose to create any sense that this thing exists in physical space and isn't just, you know, wobbling around. I was terrible at it. Um, and it, it hurt because, I was doing the same amount. I was working just as hard as everyone else. In fact, I was working a lot harder than a lot of my other friends who just naturally kicked ass at animating. Um, and, and this is where I learned that talent was real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just easier for some people. Well, this is, this is a huge debate. I, I see people debating this all the time. It could be a really contentious subject, like does talent exist? And the way that in my mind, I know that talent exists is that in in middle school, I studied way, 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 way harder at math than my buddy Kevin. My buddy Kevin wiped the floor with me and then would just go play soccer and play Earthworm Jim on the Sega mm -hmm. Genesis and not even think about it and just naturally rule at math. Um, and similarly, when I went to Cal Arts, you know, I wasn't going to parties and staying up late and making friends. All I was doing was trying to animate. And you've got kids like that guy I mentioned, Austin, just <laughs> obliterating me with their, you know, pinky finger. And I realized like, oh, like, aptitude is real like in the same way that someone is born taller you know some some people like have a space i mean i don't know if you guys have ever met james baxter yeah. but like yeah when you watch that guy draw i'm not saying he doesn't work his ass off he does yeah. but he, he literally visualizes the whole thing sure. in his mind and then basically traces the thing he sees in his head onto paper yeah. like i can't picture a rotating simba in my brain but he can <laughs> you know and, and and, and if I dedicate my life to being able to picture a rotating symbol, I'll never be as good as James. I'll get better, like, but I'll never be James, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like at CalArts, I started to recognize like, fuck, I am giving it my all and I am not catching up with the other kids. And then my sophomore, my junior year of CalArts, we had a storyboard class um, that was, it was all about, we didn't use pencils, we had to use Sharpies and we were only drawing on like big cards and our teacher would give us these basically like free ride assignments where he'd say, okay, I need to storyboard a scene. Everybody's got half an hour. Um, it's about somebody who goes to a blind date and they're surprised by who their date is. Go. Um, and you didn't have time to think about your drawing. All you had time to do was draw as fast as possible. People were doing stick figures, mm -hmm. gutting it out, but you had to try to create a scene. And I was in heaven. I, I was having so much fun. I When I would put my 
boards on the wall and pitch them. Everybody would laugh and they would, they would crack up and they'd be quoting my boards later to me. And I realized like, this is, this is my aptitude. Like I'll, I'm not going to be able to draw hands like Milk Call, but apparently off the cuff, I can come up with a scene that really entertains people. Um, okay. I'm, I'm a storyboard artist. I'm not an animator. I'm a storyboard artist. And that's how I made that, like that big change in my mind from like, like at that moment I stopped constantly beating myself up about my draftsmanship and started to just be like, okay, it's a tool to communicate ideas. Um, let me try to study everything I can about story because I think I've got a little bit of a leg up on this department. I mean, um, it's like you you were talking about doing competitive improv in high school. Yeah. That's the feat yeah. because <laughs> I hadn't heard about improv before I started working in animation. I mean, I knew the notion of it, but it's like, this is yeah. what all the, I don't know, like this is the number one advice I hear for writers, like generally. So like you had like a super leg up in, well, on top of like your natural talent for for words or like at least passion for words or English. So uh, that's really cool. Well, I was always I was always really into it and I was obsessed with it. Like in high school, I had the um, Simpsons guide to all the Simpsons episodes mm -hmm. and I memorized like I memorized the I noticed patterns. I started to be like a John VDF and John Schwartzwelder and Bill Oakley mm -hmm. and Josh Weinstein Simpson episode is often better than this writer or that writer since I was like, I was like, what are my five favorite Simpsons episodes? Wait, they were written by the five, my five favorite Simpsons writers. And I started to like itemize them and be like, okay, why are some episodes better than others? Right. Which ones make me laugh and which ones don't? And why do some feel longer than others? Even though they're all the same mm -hmm. length, it must have something to do with the way the story is built. So it's like, I was like very analytical about writing mm -hmm. like my whole life, but I never yeah, thought of myself in that category. I thought like I'm an I want to be an animator, mm -hmm. and then and then when I realized like oh yeah you're right like all that interest and 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 any aptitude and any study that I brought with me was suddenly a huge asset when it came to bringing that to my animation career. Right, because um because would you say in Cal Arts there like how how much writing oriented type classes uh, were there available when you were? Well, I'm sure it's changed a lot because when I went to Cal Arts like one it was a lot less diverse like it was a lot more male and it was there was like there was a cal art style in 2001 2002 or 2003 like when i was there careful um, you're gonna feed the trolls uh -oh. so <laughs> this, is, oh, no. this is what they wanted to hear here's the thing well they're, they're completely fucking wrong because the cal art style when i went to cal arts in 2003 was uh it was generally what it, you know if, if you took your cal art students in 2004 and you blended them in a blender you would get a friendly white Mormon guy in cargo shirt in cargo shorts with like a Jurassic Park <laughs> t-shirt and with a portfolio full yeah. of drawings trying to draw as much like Milk Call in the 70s as possible. Like all of them drew mm -hmm. like like this very specific like jungle book um, of 101 Dalmatians. Like it was all about like Roger yeah. with the Roger nose and the Roger hands playing the piano um, and, and these beautiful pencil tests. And these guys were like really figuring out how to do that style of drawing. And that's and, and everybody wanted to draw like that, get into Pixar, mm -hmm. and work on in, work on the Incredibles, and that was that was the Cal Art style, <laughs> um, and and it was very specific to yeah. that. Um, and you know the teachers, the teachers were all over the map. Some of them said, "Oh, here's how you can draw to draw like a classic figure drawing art. Here's how you can draw like Michelangelo." And then others were saying, "Here's how you can draw like." Um, you know, the show that I'm currently working on, on, on Nickelodeon, like there was no, there was no faculty, there was absolutely no degree to which the faculty was instructing on style at all. Like every teacher had a completely different perspective. Like the, the daytime faculty were people like old timers who like worked in the, like the seventies and eighties on a bunch of experimental stuff. And they were always just like, be experimental, let your feet freak flag fly. If you want to make your trees purple, paint them purple. And then the nighttime faculty would be people working at Disney or Cartoon Network saying like, oh, here's how to get a job. And here's, here's what we know about portfolios, but everybody drew differently. So there was absolutely no instruction about how to draw style, but there's just these generational tastes that happen, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that was the taste at the time. So like, most CalArt students, when I went to CalArts, had no interest in, the animators had no interest in writing. Like, mm -hmm. they just, they wanted to be the best damn, they wanted to be Glenn King, they wanted to be James Baxter. Um, and there were writing classes that you could take in the film department, um, uh, and, and I took one, but I was very intimidated by it. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know much about, like, film and, and like, screenplay structure and format. It, it wasn't until I took that storyboarding class where suddenly I was able to fuse my, like, 
drawing brain and my writing brain and understand them as like one thing, which was just like entertainment. But it's so fascinating now because like I've gone and given talks at Cal Arts and I'm like, what do you guys want to be? Where do you want to go? And like almost all the students say, oh, we want to, I want to create my own cartoon. Yeah. I want to make Steven Universe. And like when I was at Cal Arts and I said, I want to make television, everyone looked at me like I was insane. Like everyone thought like, why would you, television's trash. Like, why don't you yeah. want to go, go to Pixar? Uh, and then I ironically did end up going to Pixar and deciding, no, indeed, I do want to do television. <laughs> and then yeah. end up leaving. It's interesting how that change kind of happened. I know, I I don't know at what point. I wonder. You can maybe even trace it back to like Adventure Time era because yes. I think it suddenly became and and not just with cartoons. I think TV in general got you know better than a lot of movies. Like there was that golden age of TV, um, which I don't know if we're still in it or not. But uh, but still, like there was this shift that happened, and yeah, all of a sudden. No, it's it's really weird. I mean, like literally, you know, I graduated in '07. And it was like the, the 06, 07, you know, like that moment, suddenly car suddenly networks were, had a renewed interest in creative driven cartoons at the exact time that a lot of these folks had some really interesting ideas. I have this crazy memory that I was just thinking about the other day where Nickelodeon came to CalArts when I was a sophomore and they, they were doing this shorts program and they're like, come in and pitch us ideas for shorts and, and we might produce them. Um, it was like, I think they were trying to maybe start up a pilot program, but they hadn't figured it out yet. And I remember waiting in line and I remember Penn Ward coming out of the room after pitching his short and, and holding his guitar. And I had heard him in there singing Adventure Time. Um, and like, it was the first time he'd ever pitched it to anybody and they didn't get it at all. They were like, they were literally like, yeah, that last pitch was super crazy. <laughs> like they were kind of like, like they were kind of nagging him a little yeah. bit. Um, like, and then of course, you know, he, he then did produce it in their actual pilots program and then they passed it up because they still didn't get it. Um, like, but there was, it was like me, Penn, yeah. JG and Pat, we all wanted to make, like, we were all interested in television. Um, like the vast majority of the school was only interested in working at Disney or Pixar. Um, and that's totally flopped around now. Yeah, it's really funny because I remember when I was in college and the um, pilot, the um, uh, Adventure Time pilot came out uh, on YouTube. And like, I don't know, I feel like that was the first time I saw TV like this because up until then mm -hmm. it was kind of like, I really love Dexter's Lab or like, you know, Pop Up Girls and all that, but like, it like uh i think adventure time and then you went on to create gravity falls and then it was like regular show and it felt like all of a sudden it was like more modern it was like it kind of like shifted into a, like a new decade kind of <laughs> with the well uh, yeah so people talk about the generational these sort of these these movements of generational influence mm -hmm. um and like i have a theory about that like i really think that you know, I think that the cartoons in the 90s, like the creator revolution that was like Powerpuff Girls and Dexter's Lab, those are guys who went to Cal Arts in like, like, yeah. like the early 80s, late 70s, that had all these memories of cartoons from like the 50s and 60s. So it was like Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab, that was like Craig and Gendy's version of like UPA cartoons and Hanna-Barbera yeah. cartoons. Like that's what they grew up on. And then like, like me and JG and Penn, and, and honestly, Rebecca Sugar, you yeah. we were influenced mm -hmm. by anime and the simpsons right like it was specifically it was like what was happening in the 90s it was like the simpsons was like oh like you know if you're watching <laughs> flintstones and upa you're like i want to create something like really slick and bold if you're watching the simpsons you're like i want to create something with this like really comedic modern expansive dialogue style you know um and then also video games so it's like adventure time is like the, the, oh, what if we made a cartoon where the map just looked like the map of mario world mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah. it's like it's like S simpsons anime video games um, you know, and, and all sorts of other things, but I really do. Cause yeah. you know, there's this stupid meme about the quote unquote Cal arts style, which has literally nothing to do with Cal arts. If you had to ask me like, where does that mouth come from? That like smiley shaped mouth with the lines through it. That is literally Homer's mouth. If you rounded the edge of it, like sailor moon's mouth, now take sailor moon's mouth yeah. and put Homer's closed teeth in there and you get that mouth. It's those generational influences. No instructor yeah, ever asked for it. No executive ever asked for it. It is a generation of artists influenced by similar things yeah. who all know each other, who work on each other's shows. And then there was kind of a copycat era of people noticing that and kind of repeating it, but it's already on its way out and new generational influences are starting to happen. But like people always talk about this, like it's some weird conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> People are plotting. Yeah, or like it has anything to do with money. They always say, oh, that's the style because it's cheap. It's like, no, no, no. 
Phineas and Ferb, Pepper Ann, Gravity Falls, and Gargoyles all cost the same thing. And it's absolutely fucking nothing to do with money. It's just generational influence. And it rises and falls and changes just in the same way that style trends do, just in the same way that music trends do. Um, and, you know, that particular one is already on its way out and being reinvented by a whole new generation of, of different artists with different in in interests and intuitions. Um, and it's, it's, it's really funny to see people try to turn my college friend's way of drawing into some grand disapprover conspiracy when it's like I was we were all there drawing on a wall with a sharpie and kind of gutting some of these things out just based on our tastes <laughs> you know yeah um has there ever been a moment where you kind of weren't sure if you wanted to do animation at all or um or maybe try a different medium or something like comics or etc yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, it's just so punishing. It's the most punishing art yeah. form. Uh, like, every other art form. Dolly Parton, I think, wrote, like, 9 to 5 and Jolene in the same day. And mm -hmm. those songs will be beloved forever. Like, you can't do that in animation. Like, you can't just sit down and be like, oh, I came up with a whole season of The Simpsons and produced myself in a day. Like, in live action, you know... Obviously, it's a lot of work, but you hit record and then hit stop, uh -huh. and you just got an hour of footage. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and like you know, my, my senior year of Cal Arts, I, I experimented with anime uh, with live action a little bit. I, I made a few just kind of experimental live action films, including some where I tried to add animation, and it was like I had so much fun and the effort to reward ratio of like oh, I'm just like playing around, and now I have something to watch and edit and throw music on top of, and, and like like animation is it's it's like black magic it's like a dark art it's like stitching together a frankenstein of, of dead things that shouldn't live and then like electrocuting it to life by taking your life having it leave your body and enter this cartoon it takes everything within you to barely make it seem like it's alive and conscious um and it's so difficult so i mean yeah i'm always thinking like why don't I just pitch a reality show about uh, like <laughs> eat, competitive eating uh, in Hawaii, and then I'll just get to eat and be in Hawaii? <laughs> like, Sounds good. Sounds well, good it's way. like yeah, like the guy who did um, that HBO show, White Lotus. He literally yeah. just came up with like, what is a show that would allow me to hang out in a resort for like a month? And I'm like, man, mm -hmm. an animators don't get to live that life, you know? No, we don't. <laughs> Yeah, it's like uh, Adam Sandler always makes these movies that like end up in some resort and it's like a bunch of dudes just hanging out on the beach. And it's like they just got to have a paid vacation. For uh, a hundred percent. A million yeah. percent. Yeah, I mean, it's I, an amazing scam. I, I often do. I often do have like, you know, like, like think about like live action is a medium that I love because you have to be spontaneous and you can create things quickly and iterate quickly. And it's. You don't really get that quick iteration, that spontaneity in animation as much. Um, like, and, and I do sometimes just generally, you know, question. I, I, I make cartoons because it's fun for me, and I, 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 think, I, I think people like the things I make. But I don't have any illusions that, like, I'm changing the world. Like, I feel like every single nurse and every single teacher uh, is probably more valuable than, like, all of Disney animation put together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like in terms of just like helping people in the world like I, I don't know like I know a lot of animators who are like the power of storytelling is saving lives and changing and I'm like eh, if you want to change lives like go work in a soup kitchen like, yeah. like, like I think it's I think there's irresponsible storytelling and there's better storytelling but like I also in my mind I'm like my way of trying to help the world is if I make money through this thing <laughs> I'm good at that's fun maybe I can donate that to worthy causes but like I, like sometimes there are days where I'm like, should I just like quit this and work for the Bernie Sanders campaign? Like, what am I doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? No, I've had those moments too. <laughs> I think that I think that um, there is something to be said for like you mentioned, like the responsible storytelling. And yeah, um, yeah. If somebody wants to make a gag and you know based animation, that's great. But I do sort of feel like for all the pain and suffering that, that we that I've had to endure to get to the point where I am and you probably feel the same. It's like I, I can't not try to push for certain representation or thing, you know, absolutely. I, like, I, absolutely. Well, I, and I want to make it clear. That's the benefit. Yeah, I want to make it clear. I think there's a spectrum of better to worse media. Um, yeah. Like and I think that if you have an audience, there is a there. If you have a large audience and a captive audience, there is a responsibility to think about you know, 
am I putting something useful and good out there or am I, am I, you know, there, no, I think that's good. I think it's a good bit of, uh, wisdom, I guess. Or, or, or I'm just being cranky. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but it's good to have perspective because it is like, you know, especially during the pandemic, you know, oh, yeah. you're like, why, am, why, why do I still have a job? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know yeah, what yeah. I'm saying? It's kind of, it, you kind of, it gets pretty existential in that way. So I guess it's good to always kind of like go back to the the root of like, why is this medium? Uh, what What is the, is there, is it important? If it is, you know, like, why is it important? So like, I think you've answered that in a very thoughtful way. And yeah. which makes a lot of sense. Something that I uh, kind of struggle with sometimes is, is, you know, we're talking about high art and low art and like, I feel like, you know, <laughs> I've dedicated my whole life to, to this thing and so to me, it's very important. And obviously, like what you're saying, like this is not at all uh, anything that's life-saving or anything that's that important in the grand scheme of things. But within the paradigm of like animation or uh, art, I guess, I often struggle with like people put fine art on such a pedestal and treat it with such like reverence. But animation to the world at large is not, nobody really thinks of it as high art most of the time it's just like entertainment fluff is do you have an opinion on that within just animation it's or, or uh, art itself as a medium yeah i mean i i think that i do think that's changing a little bit though and, and i think it's changed a lot even just in our lifetimes because like i don't and maybe it's because i'm so cloistered in the animation industry and because i'm connected to animation fans but i see a lot more passion in fan spaces than I see in conversations about fine art right now. <laughs> um, it's, you know what I mean? It's generational, and, right? Yeah, yeah and, and maybe it's because I'm not hanging out in the fine art scene, but I do think that, like, you know, as working in, in, in television and movies, which are, which are you know, popular arts, I, I feel that there is, a, there is a passion and a love and a connection and an obsession with the stories being told in the popular arts that, that I don't that I don't see outward so it's it's even even though maybe and even a pretension sometimes I mean I feel like I feel like I see them all the time people you know online who are animation connoisseurs and who will pick apart why this one cartoon is the second coming of Jesus and why this other one is a crime against nature and and with with, with all the pomposity of a classic fine arts professor you know so I, I do think we are we are we are gaining that type mm -hmm. of respect and expectation and also because that's the thing it's like what what comes with the respect of fine art also comes with the absolute savagery of fine art criticism yeah. Um, yeah. and so i think animation is beginning to gain that respect and that savagery um and i think it's it's a beautiful thing like i want people you know as someone who creates stuff i want people to care about it and and love it and, and engage with it um, you know, that's the whole reason we do this is to connect with other human beings and, and you want them to connect at a visceral emotional level. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's the ultimate goal. So like, I do feel like, but I, I, I know what you mean. I mean, I, I think you'll sometimes see people in animation try to leave for live action. And it sometimes looks like it's because they want that live action Oscar. Cause they think that's more mm -hmm. prestigious than yeah. the animated Oscar. Um, and like, I don't know, like, I guess that need for prestige I mean, it's, it's all in how you see yourself and what you want to be. Like, I don't see myself as an artist. Um, mm. I see myself as an entertainer. And, Interesting, yeah. and I love entertainment. And I love to entertain. And I think, and, and, and I consume entertainment. And entertainment makes me feel sane. Like, the entertainment that I love, like my mm -hmm. favorite shows, my favorite movies, they help me feel less lonely. And, yeah, they, yeah. and they, make, they help me organize my mental internal world. And I have a very personal connection to them. So, like... I want to create entertainment that has the ability to do that for other people the way it does for me. Um, but the, it's, it's not as important to me that, that, that I have some sort of scholar who says that the thing I've done is objectively respectable right. <laughs> 10,000 years from now. Like I, <laughs> I, 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 I'd rather make a character that people love and, and do imitations of uh, around the house than, than like a college class taught about how like I defined like a new form of a new movement or something like because those are the things like growing up I like studied art but I studied The Simpsons much more mm -hmm. you know right. um, and so it's like I knew I, I knew the names of all the great classic artists and I thought they were cool but I didn't have as much I never had as much of an emotional response 
to anything I saw as a, in, in a museum um, as I did to, you know, my favorite television shows, plot twists. And that's just me. Like, that's the way my brain works. So, like, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't have that need for, like, the prestige or whatever. Like, I don't, I don't discount people who do need it. Um, like, and I work with people who I consider to be absolute fucking, absolute golden ass artists, like real, true, foundational artists. And I see them pushing like their corner of like their medium forward. And I respect the hell out of it. And I, I want to do that in everything I do because it's just interesting. Um, and because I respect it, but me, myself, like I'm trying to create entertainment and I, I don't think that's a dirty word. Like I'm like, I want to create thoughtful entertainment. I want to create yeah. engaging entertainment. I want to create entertainment that engages you emotionally, that makes you laugh, that makes you interested. But where it goes from being entertainment to art, that that line, I just don't concern myself with that. And if I get lucky and my right. entertainment accidentally starts becoming art because we cared so much, then I'll like let someone else say, it's art, you did it. But like I stay away from saying like it has to be art and I'm an artist yeah. um, because that carries with it like such, I don't know, such such power and drama that like I'm like, like, I'll let someone else decide that, you know what I mean? I'll just try to say, like, is this, is this compelling? And am I compelled? And if I'm compelled, I hope other people will be too, you know? I think that makes a lot of no, sense. Totally. Yeah. What are, you were talking about, like, some of your favorite movies or TV shows help you make sense of life. What are, well, obviously The Simpsons, but what are the ones that you saw recently that did that for you? I mean, it's, I'm a weird person, so my answers are going to be very weird. <laughs> <laughs> Let, um, hit us with it. Like, well, it's like, I, this is the biggest difference between like, um, one of my best friends, Michael Rianda, who directed Mitchell's versus the Machines, which, I think, show. which yeah. I think has a fucking shot at the Oscar this year. I'm going to call it and yeah. I'm going to say, God, I, think I, it's so. gonna, I think it's going to get the fucking Oscar. I could be totally wrong, uh, but if I'm right, if someone listens to this later, then I'll say he called it. Um, yeah. But, you know, Mike loves film. And he, you know, like, like Mike will see Lady Bird or something that's like a touching vignette about a moment in time and a grounded human experience of, of like a family and like it will he'll be thinking about ladybird for weeks right mm -hmm. um i'll watch ladybird i'll love ladybird and then i'll kind of get distracted by something else but i will see an episode of nathan for you and literally be thinking yeah. about it for months <laughs> um, okay like that there's certain types of weird surreal comedy that like electrify my brain and rewire what I think is possible in the world. And like that, that stuff sticks with me. Like I'm a very strange person. So it's like, like, yeah, it's like, like really weird cutting edge comedy is the kind of stuff that often like really, really sticks with me. Um, I obviously, I was obsessed with Breaking Bad when it was out and I like, yeah. I was, I was addicted to it like nothing else. And I was like so emotionally invested. Here's the weird thing. I wasn't just emotionally invested in the characters. I was emotionally invested in Vince Gilligan and the idea that he had caught this runaway train of this perfect show and had to figure out how to land it and slow it down and end it. And I was like, I hope this ending is good to show me that it's possible to make a thing that's good that ends well because it's so hard to end a television show. Like, I'm invested in Walt and Jesse, but I'm also invested in, like, can the Breaking Bad writer's room take this plane right. and land it mm -hmm. when it's, mm -hmm. like, 90% of the time it's impossible to have a good finale, you know? So, like, I get yeah. really, really right. wrapped up in the drama of not just a show, but even the drama behind mm -hmm. it and the, and the sort of, like, like can this be done? Um, like, you know, right yeah. now, I'm not sure if there's a show that I'm, like, like, Oh, a Succession. I'm like totally addicted to Succession. I got um, it. Like, just love it. it's it's hard because it, it's like really unlikable characters and like the first mm -hmm. few episodes you're like I hate everybody, but if you can stick through to the finale of season one, I think you will be like a thousand percent hooked. Like yeah. I don't know anybody who's made it through that season and then by okay. the wasn't like obsessed with it, you know. Yeah, there's definitely a buzz around it that I feel like is similar to other shows where it was like, you got to stick with it. You're like, I swear to God, like it's, it gets better yeah. by the end. So I got to I gotta check it out. <laughs> so, Breaking so, Bad is an interesting one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just, just Nathan for you and Succession, you know? <laughs> okay, okay. Those, those, those are, are very those interesting are answers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Breaking Bad's funny because like, when they, you know how when they showed like the gun in the beginning of whatever uh, last season that was, like they didn't know what that was going to be. Like, so it really was just like, it really was this story that they didn't quite know how it was going to land. And so, uh, well, that's, that's yes. to know that stuff. They all agree on it. And it's like yeah. a yeah. magical thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I've talked to Rebecca about like midway through Steven where the whole team really knew each other. And I, I get the sense that like, cause I asked her like, how the hell do you do continuity with 11 minute episodes? Yeah. Like, and, and she would talk about like, well, we do these pitches and after each pitch, we would have the entire team debate whether every character was in character. And I'm like, 
I don't know. I, I, I never wow. have, How do you have time for that? Like, I still yeah. don't understand it. Um, but <laughs> bake it into the schedule. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I I was gonna ask about. Well, I th I think it's fun. I think a lot of people don't realize that animation and and TV as well is is not as plotted out as they think like it is like you're saying like it's just this train that's just like going and you're just hoping that it's not going to go off the rails and so like it's a miracle that everything comes together the way that it does yes and uh full disclosure i've been watching gravity falls this is before uh we even booked you uh for the show i was just like i want to rewatch gravity falls and um and it's amazing and it's great and, and i I am very, still very impressed with how you clearly had an end goal in mind and being able to maintain that throughout uh, two seasons is crazy because I, I know how hard it is to, especially when you're going through development, like how hard it is to maintain that kind of um, integrity of the story and everything. And I'm wondering how hard it was to fight for that when you were going through uh, development and production. Yeah, I mean, it, we were we were on completely like untrodden territory trying to make that series because like I, I it, it hadn't been my I didn't watch you know when, when when I sold Gravity Falls it was like I didn't I wasn't watching a lot of kids television or or family right. television there wasn't a lot of family or kids television that I was specifically you know I except for Adventure Time um, yeah and and I. I hadn't aspired to make family television. I, I like I said, I wanted to make The Simpsons, and so w when Disney was interested in, in my idea for a family television show, I said, like, how could I come up with a family show that I would watch? And the answer to that was, well, it would have to take its, it would have to have stakes, and it would have to have, it would have to reward my attention and say, there's a reason to watch all of these episodes and not just skip around, um, and it would have to have the things that I loved when I was when I was a kid. Which was like I like I loved the Who Shot Mr. Burns episode of The Simpsons mm -hmm. growing up because it was a two parter and there was a mystery and I wanted to know the answer and I was like whoa it took all these characters that made me laugh and then created like a high stakes situation that took that pitted all of them against each other and had yeah, like that was mind blowing at the actual time. well crafted mystery to it and so I was like mm -hmm. well, can I make a whole show that's Who Shot Mr. Burns right um, yeah. and 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 you know at the time that I I pitched Gravity Falls there were no no animated television series there's no animated television comedy series that weren't 11 minutes like every single one was the spongebob model which is a great model for a great type of cartoon but the only half hour shows in animation were action shows and action shows they did have continuity but they were often pretty humorless and very much of like the superhero or anime structure um and i was trying to bring sort of that more classic animation comedy into a half hour structure and there was nothing like that when i pitched this you know the streaming was barely a, like like Netflix was barely a thing at the time, and so like the idea of a show that you know tastes like a Cartoon Network show, but has like right. a, a a Fox show length, and then maybe has like you know, but the continuity of an action show is just nothing like that at all. Um, but that's why I was interested in making it. I was like, I'm not watching a lot of family animation. The type of family animation I would want to see would have to have all those ingredients. So we're gonna do it, um, and I like I made that part of my deal. They were like, okay, we want a green light Gravity Falls. So I was like, they have to be half hours. You have to let me continu do continuity because if I'm not doing those things, I'm not interested in the show. Um, and I I thought that the reason that nobody had done that yet in the animation kids animation space was that maybe uh, no one had thought of it, or maybe uh, folks were just following trends, or or. Or, or, or maybe I was some genius, and, and, and that's why no one had done it. And then as soon as I started doing it, I realized the no reason nobody had done it was it's an insane, impossible thing to try to do. And it, it, with, with the budget and timeline of a family network, trying to do something that has, you know, the continuity of, of a live action series and comedy, comedy of a Simpsons show, like, you know, they have 12 Harvard writers, and, and we're lucky if we can get four buddies together, you know, yeah. and, and we have to do 20 episodes a season. It was just one of these things where it's like, oh, oh, we're trying to fit an elephant through the eye of a needle here, and we are building a plane as we're flying it, and we're just going to have to figure it out. And, like, you know, to Disney's credit, they were really supportive. Like, like the creative executives were really excited by my enthusiasm, really believed in my vision, and had they never tried to say, don't do this. They just said... As long as the episodes are funny individually, we'll let you have this little these winks and nods of continuity. And as long as 
You're ah. hiding the secret messages you want to hide as long as they're not satanic and as long as they don't slow the sh <laughs> as long as they don't slow the show down. Like we won't stop you from doing what you want as long as you also do what we want, which is it mm. still has to be funny. Boys and girls still need to like it. It still has to have adventure. You know what I mean? And as long as you're giving us our you know, our, our steak, you can have all the crazy side dishes you want. Um, and like, then I was just dis discovering like, oh, like this amount of side dishes with this amount of time in the kitchen and th this few ingredients is like impossible. And I'm going to have to cut off my own hand and serve it a steak this week because we are, like, we are trying to do something that's just, we're not set up for this. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so yeah. it, what that basically meant for me was just like doing a personal pass on every single script to make sure that things did hook up so that that if we establish in one episode that um mabel has a pet pig then she still has a pet pig next week yeah. <laughs> you know um, yeah. those types of things holistically across the board but it was it was a giant experiment um it required hiring a lot of people from totally different disciplines people from feature people who were mm -hmm. totally new who'd never done anything before people who were writing but hadn't written this type of show and it was sort of this like kind of ragtag team of like we've got this crazy vision that has there's nothing we can really compare it to on this channel or on the channels that we're currently competing with. We just have to solve it and figure it out. And, and now, you know, there's so many more animated series with, with continuity and with a mix of comedy, but also a little bit of horror even. Um, and like, it's, it's awesome seeing that. Um, but it was, it was really challenging. I mean, it just required a lot of that kind of improv brain of like thinking on your feet and reacting. And then like, doing a pitch and then seeing how people are responding to it. And then that evening watching an animatic and realizing that the change in the animatic means I have to change mm. the pitch, but also people laughed at this one thing, which means we should probably keep it. And I'll add that to episode seven and just always being yeah. aware of everyone's reaction and trying to cohere it into something that sort of feels like one vision, you know? And that's why you mm -hmm. slept for a year yeah. after it was done. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, we like real. to ask our guests uh, how they deal with creative block and also what it feels like for you. Yeah. Um, so like creative block, you know, I don't, usually my problem with creative block is that there's different kinds of it. Like when it comes to writing, my biggest challenge is often that I'll have too many ideas and, and it's hard to decide which of the three ways that this episode could end is the best one. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And so like, you know, on Gravity Falls, for example, we had, we would write episodes by we have a big wall of like, what are crazy magical genre things that we'd love to see? Oh, we'd love to see a lake monster episode. We'd love to see a time travel episode. And then we'd have a wall of what are, um, you know, personal growing up stories that feel like they'd be interesting. Oh, oh, I, I remember this time where uh, I was mad that my sister was an inch taller than me. Or, oh, I remember this time where uh, I felt like I wasn't as, as masculine as my uncle and I needed to prove myself. Um, you know, or I remember my first crush. I remember school dance that made me uncomfortable or uh, whatever it is. And so you've got these two walls. And, and, and uh, me and my buddy Mike, who I was telling you about, Mitchells vs. Machines, we are, the big thing we always talk about in writing is um, invention and, and, and observation. Those are like our two, uh, our two it, like, if we had a Triforce, it would be on one corner it's invention, on one corner it's observation, and on the other corner it's um, iterating, which just means like mm -hmm. reading your script to other people and seeing if they give a shit or not. And it's just like iterate, invent, observe. Iterate, invent, observe. And so like on that wall, it was like invent was the magic side, observe was the childhood memory side. And then iterating is the part where it would get challenging, where I'd sit down and I'd try to puzzle piece these th two things together and say, okay, like, you know, if I'm going to do an episode about twins, I'd do an episode about twins and growing up. And I remember being a twin and people always thinking we were the same person. So, oh, what if we did an episode where Dipper and Mabel meet another pair of twins that are much better at being twins, that actually do act like identical twins and that and that do have a stronger bond. And Dipper and Mabel start to feel like they're bad twins. Okay, great. That's what, okay, that's interesting. Okay, well now what's the magic of the episode? Okay, well, okay, well there's a there's a trope in media about like spooky twins who seem psychic or even finish each other's sentences. There's the shining twins, there's children of the corn. Yeah. Well, what if Dipper and Mabel encounter these other spooky twins that seem perfect and Dipper and Mabel try to be like them? And then they realize that their differences actually are their strengths. And, and there's some third act set piece where the spooky twins do something scary as a result of being too similar. And, and you're like, okay, those pieces seem great. And then you step out, okay, act one, act two, act three. What does Dipper want? What does Mabel want? Is there a beast story with Seuss? And then you hit that third act and you're like, what is, what's happened? What, what scary thing do the twins do that feels cool and that isn't redundant? Well, we did Gideon. So we, we did an episode about a little creepy pale psychic 
Uh, are these guys just like Gideon? And so like that's where we would hit blocks is we'd have these great pieces and then we'd hit like a wall of like, and often my way of trying to solve that would be instead of being like, okay, if I've got three days to solve this script and a third act is not working, instead of spending three days just throwing effort at a third act that isn't working, I'm going to spend day one trying to come up with like five different versions of act three. And then the morning of the next day, I'm going to show those five different versions of act three, the people I trust most and say, do any of these seem better to you? And I'll probably show them to two or three people so I get a plurality of consensus and not just one person's opinion. So I'll show it to my buddy Mike, who's really got a good sense of like emotion. I'll show it to my buddy Rob, who's really good at like the nuts and bolts of storytelling. I'll show it to my buddy uh, Matt, who's like a real genre fan and understands what... And, and if all of them say number three is better than the other four, I'll take that one and I'll iterate it forward, right? Um, so like I often just try to use like... If I'm, struggling, if I'm struggling to come up with anything at all, I just dig into the well of personal observation... And, and if I'm trying to make the personal observation interesting, then I just sort of try to get playful, listen to music, like listen to music that feels like what I want my show to feel like and think about those emotions and draw and just kind of goof off and let my mind wander and, and try to think of something inventive. Um, and then, yeah, that third triangle of Triforce, that iterating where it's just mm -hmm. like, if it's not working, you'll know when a story's clicking. It'll start writing itself. Yeah. And if it yeah. keeps not... If it keeps not working, usually it's not that you need to push harder, it's that you need to push from a different angle. And yeah. like it, developing that intuition in your mind to say, we've been trying on this script for exactly three weeks, now's the time to throw it out. Because it's it, like it, if we spend two more weeks on it, it's not going to magically get easy. It's hard because there's something in it that doesn't work. There's, there's something in it where the, uh, the stakes are weak or the plan that the main character has is unclear, or the story is about an idea but not about characters. Um, and let's quickly try to improvise and think on our feet about things that, you know, we had an episode on Gravity Falls, um, first season, a double dipper, where it's a, the dipper clones himself. Um, mm -hmm. And that episode came out of the idea, me and Michael Rianda were watching a lot of Party Down, which is a great television show. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it has such a good structure because Party Down is about a bunch of unwork, uh, 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 out of work actors who are working as caterers in Hollywood. So you've got people who want nothing more than to be actors catering events where everyone who has everything they've ever dreamed of is. And you get to see them up against their dreams while, while being at the bottom of the totem pole and always trying to get directors to read their scripts and always trying to ask if they could be in movies. And it's, and it's, but the other thing that's great about it is they're catering parties and parties are social events and the best stories are social. Like, mm -hmm. this is why, like, an episode of Seinfeld is often more memorable than an entire Marvel movie, because we remember social faux pas better than we remember the end of the world, right? So, you know, just just a story about, like, you know, oh, uh, you know, uh, my, 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 my friend thinks that the girl dumped me because I double text too much. Is it too thirsty to text twice if somebody doesn't text after your first text? Yeah. Am I texting wrong? Like... You see an episode about that and you start thinking about, oh, shit, am I texting wrong? And it, like, sticks with you because it's social, right? So, like, party stories are social. And so this is such a long, weird tangent. But me and Mike are like, we need to have a party story in Gravity Falls because we've been watching Party Down and it tells us that great stories are social. How can we have, like, a school dance party episode? Okay, well, maybe Grunkle Stan is throwing a party at the Mystery Shack. Why? There's literally no reason why Grunkle Stan should throw a party at the Mystery Shack, but we know that Grunkle Stan's greedy, so we'll just say that he's trying to get kids to come to the Mystery Shack, and that's why he's throwing a kid's party. Doesn't make any sense. Just go with it. All right, great. What are the wants? All right. What would Dipper's want be with the party? Well, when I was a kid and I went to parties, I was really scared of dancing, so maybe Dipper wants to stop the party. He hates parties. He doesn't want it to happen. And we worked for three weeks on an episode where Dipper's whole goal was to conjure a monster to stop the party because parties make him uncomfortable. Um, and it was terrible because Dipper was super unlikable. The story mm. didn't go anywhere. The story kept hitting a wall. And I think, you know, if it had been an 11 minute episode instead of a 21 minute episode, you probably could have right. slid by because it's just half the length and half the length means half the need for dramatic investment. And it can just be a silly little one-off, but 21 minute episodes are unforgiving. If there isn't a, a, a Grounded emotional core, you're going to get bored around minute seven or yeah. around, around minute like 13 where you notice that it's not going anywhere. So like that's an episode that we were just like pounding our heads. And then finally we had to admit like it's not working. We have to throw it out. We need a brand new want. 
what's a better want for Dipper? And somebody's like, maybe Dipper just wants to dance with Wendy. And I was like, well, okay. Observation. When I was in middle school, I was terrified of dancing with a girl. I never would have been naive enough to think I had a shot. And then I was like, but I've been writing Dipper like myself and nothing's been happening. So what if Dipper was more naive? That is. What if he had a sweet optimism? (laughs) What if he was trying to ask Wendy to dance, but he was scared to ask Wendy to dance. So he tried to get someone to help him and he only trusts himself. Okay. Holy shit. And then like in 10 minutes, we came up with the whole episode. Right. Um, And it was like, just clicked. Yeah. Well, and, 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 what, what it required, what it required was being honest about what wasn't working, tracing it back to the character's motive, and making a change. And in that yeah. one, it was like, mm-hmm. okay, I have to mm-hmm. agree that Dipper's not me, let him be a little bit sweeter than I am, and suddenly he's flawed in a lovable way, and now you want what he wants. And so, like, like, like creative block sometimes means throw it, cutting out the tumor and, and starting over. You know what I mean? Like just, yeah. just saying like, like I've, I've read this in front of an audience and no one's connecting to it. There's something under the hood. It's not just a superficial change. I need to quickly iterate on something that, that actually gets a reaction out of a room and not just lie to myself and pretend it's working because I have a deadline and I, and, and, and maybe, maybe I'm secretly a genius and everything I touch is great. And then a year later have the episode come out and realize, no, the aud- you can't trick the audience. You can't trick the audience. Like they will, they will tell you if it sucks. Yeah, exactly. Quick question: Would you ever write a show or episode or anything in in a genre where like all the characters are unlikable, kind of like Succession? W- would that be? So- <laughs> <laughs> would you do that, or is that just not really in your like um, favorite place you write? I have a hard time with it. I I I, I really love. I don't know. I have a hard time. I think I, as a writer, need need to need to love my characters in order to care enough about them to even finish the script. Um, sure. Like, but as an audience, I can absolutely enjoy deplorable, irredeemable characters if if the world that they're in bloodies mm-hmm. them up enough mm-hmm. that I can enjoy like learning, like 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 the, like the job of a if you have a show like Succession where the characters are terrible, the job of the show is to build up these monsters and then to constantly slice them and make them bleed and show you what's inside yeah. them. And, and like, and, and that voyeuristic look inside the monster is like, oh, there's me inside this monster. I can relate to them. Now I'm bonded. And I'm almost bonded double because I started out so skeptical. Now the fact that they made me care makes me trust them even more. Like, I, I love it when shows do that. But me as a writer myself, I don't think I have the patience to get through a script with a character who I actively love. You know what I mean? Like, I just... Right. Yeah. I, I just... I, 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 something about me, I, 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 I can't do it, but I respect people who can, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. I was just wondering. I was just wondering about, like, your sensibility on that because that's, like, yeah, that's really funny. Um, more questions? Uh, we've got some good questions from Twitter that we'd love to ask you. Um, from at Cash Cash. Uh, what was it like gradually getting more responsibility with your positions as you went further in your animation career? And would you recommend people try to rise in a similar way or is it okay to stick to a position you're comfortable in? Um, I went from a uh, board artist with only a few boards under my belt to showrunner running an entire team way wow. too fast, way too fast. Um, yeah. And even though I don't regret it and love the work that I did and, and, and made some of the best relationships in my life, all my, so many of my favorite people, lifelong friends I met on Gravity Falls and we were in the trenches together. Um, but like, I think, I think the best, if you want to be a showrunner one day, um, I think working in storyboarding and, 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 and directing and, and scripting is a really, really good, um, really, really good area to spend a lot of time because that's the, that's sort of the blueprint stage. And if that stage is broken, it, it sort of doesn't matter. The following stages, they can't, you, yes. beautiful mm-hmm. construction can't fix a broken blueprint. So I think right. those yeah. are really, really valuable stages to, to be involved in and learn in. But like truly, I think the more animation jobs you've had in animation, like if you've been a board artist, a prop designer, uh, 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 you yeah. know, worked mm-hmm. worked in editorial. Uh, you know, also maybe yep. been an assistant at some stage. Hell, maybe you've been a timer or something. Like the more 
more experience you have in different corners of it, the better you're going to understand once you're in charge, like what that job is, what those people need and how to be a good boss. Like, you know, when I came into Gravity Falls, it was like, you know, I was like a baby with a machine gun. <laughs> I was just like, you know, suddenly, and I, and I, I really tried to be, um, you know, I tried to be as, 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 as emotionally aware with that responsibility as I possibly could, but you would get into these situations where, you know, you're a month behind and the executives are, are breathing down your neck. And the only way that you can take the ship and steer it out of the whirlpool is by locking yourself in the captain's cabin and like you're like holding with all your strength that wheel like all the way like left to pull it out of that out of that whirlpool and 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 then you know then somebody will tap on your door and say hey i need you to prove something and you'll be like if i let go of this wheel the the, the boat is sinking you know what i mean and like and, and then people yeah. are like geez prickly pear in there and you're like yes yeah. and, and you know it and you're like oh I, uh, I I wish I was a little less prickly in this moment but I'm like I'm literally trying to save all of us right now and like you know like it's those are the things where like nothing can really prepare you for being a showrunner like even if you've done all the other jobs yeah. like the creative responsibility and the balance between yeah the pressure yeah the pressure and the balance between I want to have a workplace where I brought all these wonderful people together and I want everyone to feel um, valued and respected um, and and to and, and to understand that their work is meaningful um, and to feel like and to feel safe um, the balance between all of that and like oh oh crap like we just got episode three and it just made yeah. the main character a horrible bastard that no one will love. And if we just put that on television, the show will get canceled and then no one will have a job. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're like yeah. always having to balance between just like, is the vision working and, and, and is the office coherent? And, and it's something that I think even if you have done every job and had all the experience in the world, it's just, it's just incredibly challenging, you know? Um, yeah. And so like, I don't think people fully, I'll oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. I was just gonna say like, 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 you know, I, I, if I had a time machine, like I wouldn't go back and change a lot because I'm proud of the work and the friends that I made. But like, sure. I, I, yeah. I would say to somebody like, somebody's like, oh, well, okay. If, if, you know, if, if, if Penn Ward made Adventure Time right out of college and if Alex made uh, Gravity Falls right out of college, wh why shouldn't I? I'd say like, you absolutely mm. can and go for it. But holy shit, your life will be so much better if you yeah. spend 10 years getting like to know this world and this craft before you find yourself in that showrunner's chair, because you'll have so much more knowledge, so much more experience. You'll understand everything better. You'll have a deeper bench of contacts. So you'll know who to hire versus having to take a bunch of chances on yep. people that you know nothing about. Like it will serve them and you, the more experience you do have, like the lower, probably a lot of people's blood pressure will be by the time that you're in that seat. Like, you know, if you want to fucking try to uh, lasso a tornado and jump in and, and ride it all the way, like, good luck. But it will try to tear you and everyone else apart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, it's very, very challenging. That's really great to I think hear. it's also for, good. For real. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm really glad that you say that. And I kind of want to, like, pause on it for a little bit just for, like, the audience to really, like, know it's totally okay to not get a show after you're out of college yeah. and it's really great to like yeah. take the time to uh find out who you are as a person what you the stories you love to tell and mm -hmm. exactly everything you said alex so that was well it's you know, also it, it's also okay it's also okay to not Run. exactly like, like yes it, yeah. that doesn't yeah. have yes. to be that doesn't have to be the end goal of everybody in every in every field Absolutely. like i wanted to run a show because like i'm like oh i've got a billion stories that are just like shooting out of my eyeballs and and, and if i don't put them into something i'll just be ranting on a street <laughs> corner but like like you, you have to have you, you shouldn't try to create a show just because you think that's like the top of some ladder and that that will get you more respect because yeah. if you don't if you don't have that thing that like demands itself to be authored by you and you just try to do it because you think that that's like, you will be really stressed out in that position. If you don't feel like you have that clarity of vision or that, or that, that story that you are yeah. ready to tell, you know what I mean? Um, and I, and I do sometimes feel like I see people where th selling the show is as far as they, they're like, I can't wait to sell a show and be a showrunner. And it's like, you shouldn't be thinking yes. about that. You should be thinking about the show. You know what I mean? Because if you're thinking about like, what does this look like for my career? You're probably going to be in a position where 
once you find yourself actually writing, you're like, oh, I don't really know these characters that well, but now I have a hundred people asking me about them. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's yeah. way more terrifying than the idea yeah. of like running a show is so much harder than people think it is. Um, and I've said this to multiple mm -hmm. fro runners. I mean, you're a boss. It's, it's not enough to just have an idea. Like you are a boss. I think a lot of people don't fully comprehend that. Either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you are, you are the boss of many, many people. And, and so many people, it's sort of like, I think that the hardest thing, particularly for young showrunners, and, and, and I had to learn this the hard way, it's just like, it's like you're walking around being you, and then one day you are 100 feet tall, but you still feel exactly like yourself, and you still look like yourself, and you're still you know, wearing the same ratty tatter jeans and writing your uh, grocery shopping list in Sharpie on your hand because uh, you can't find a pad of paper, and you know, uh, mm -hmm. you're still eating a sloppy tuna sandwich and it's dropping on the table, and you're still rambling <laughs> anecdotes about you know, this and that from your weekend, but suddenly you're 100 feet tall. Um, yeah. But you can't... You don't, from your vantage point, you look like you're the same height, but to everyone else, you're now 100 feet tall. So you will make a casual comment like you would have made yesterday back before you were 100 feet tall, and it will change someone's entire month. You know, you will, you will say to somebody, you know, they'll say, what do you think of my storyboard? And you'll say like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, you know, I feel like, I feel like we, we mm. got to work on the cinematography. And then you'll just pop out and they will spend a week feeling like I'm failed, I'm gonna get fired, I'm not good enough at cinematography. Like, like you have such an outsized power in how people feel about themselves, how they feel about their career, how they feel about their position within the hierarchy of the workplace. Um, and like, it, you also have to be a cheerleader. Like, you can't just be a coach. Uh, you have to be a cheerleader and sometimes a quarterback. Um, and if you don't do that cheerleading part, like, a lot of people could be in a lot of pain silently and you won't know because yeah. you forget that you're a hundred feet tall and that you were just wading through the village and having a stroll and you stomped on people's houses. You know, it's, it's, it's one of many forms of privilege. And that's the thing right. is like privilege is often invisible to the privilege, particularly if you're super young and if you've never, if you haven't had enough jobs, you know what I mean? Um, and so it's like, that's the thing I always tell like new showrunners is like, don't lie. Like, don't tell somebody that they're doing good work if, if the work needs to be changed. But be very effusive with deserved praise. Because, like, if somebody did something great, they need to know it. And if you don't say it, they'll just be wondering, did I do a good job or not? You know what I mean? I'm, like, there's a million things like that. I'm so happy you're saying that. This is something that's, like, really needed in the industry. Not to say exactly what you said. It's like, people are not going out of their way to, to be mean or anything. But they just forget like bosses and stuff and i think it's so great to like mention it like it's it's good to offer praise when there is praise to be given because it does so much for morale and then the team is just yeah. like yeah like it like it will really make a big difference <laughs> so, sometimes i overdo it where i'll hire a really great artist and every time i see their art i say sincerely that's the best thing i've ever seen and then i'll yeah, realize that they don't I've like devalued my own praise because they're starting to think they're like, well, he says that. Oh, he, right. <laughs> he says that about everything. I can't be that good. It's like, no, you really are that good. Oh, but yeah. Oh crap! I I I was too honest with how much I love your work, and yeah. now you think my honesty doesn't isn't oh, true. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, you know. People. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're complicated. Every, you, yeah, yeah. You can't control how people perceive. Yeah. Them. Yeah. From at the morning short asked, do you have any advice on ways to combine stories and characters and ideas that you enjoy and are true to you, and making those ideas marketable for a network or a streaming service? I, um, I I would never think the word marketable. I'd strike that word from your from your vocabulary. Would be my first advice to this person. I'd say forget the word marketable and replace it with the word um, compelling, and replace mm. it with the word uh, urgent, and with the word interesting. Um, and, and yes, with the, with the mm -hmm. word that everyone hates, but God damn it, it's true. Relatable. Um, yeah. like I think people think about pitching an idea to an executive, like it's this mysterious thing with all these secret rules, but it's actually exactly the same as telling your friend a funny story about something that happened to you over the weekend. It, it has the exact same rules, which is like, you know, when, you know, when something kind of interesting happens and you, you're like, oh, I've got a great anecdote and you're hanging out with some friends and you're like excited to drop the anecdote. Like, and you just, you can just tell that it's, it's like, it's got a bit of gossip in it, or it's about something that everyone can relate to, or it's so crazy that no one will believe you. Like, those are the same ingredients that go into a pitch. It's just like, is there something about the storytelling of this that grabs me 
surprises me, but also reminds me of myself. And so often that just comes down to just like, you know, if your story is about, let's say you're obsessed with dragons and robots. So you've created Dragon Bots and it's, you're like, Dragon Bots is going to be the most important show of this century and I want to make a thousand episodes and a billion toys. Um, the way that you sell Dragon Bots is, is not by talking about the toys, although it helps for Nickelodeon, but they're already thinking that. The way you sell Dragon Bots is by being like, okay, well, what's, like, what are the relationships between these Dragon Bots? Okay, this Dragon Bot has always been overshadowed by his older brother, Dragon Bot, who gets all the praise from their Dragon Bot mom, who's the Dragon Bot chieftain. So my Dragon Bot has to prove himself, but he's, uh, he's the only Dragon Bot who, uh, you know, can't do X, Y, or Z. Well, now anyone who's ever been jealous can relate to this story. Or this Dragon Bot is in love with a, uh, what's the opposite of a dragon and the opposite of a robot? Um, uh, I, <laughs> a fleshy goblin. I don't, yes. I don't know. Yes. This, this dragon bot is in love with a fleshy goblin, but uh, fleshy goblins are forbidden from the dragon bot village. Well, everyone knows what it's like to have unrequited love. It's like you're, yeah. you're looking to add the emotion, the urgency, the relatability in even the most outlandish, ridiculous story. It's like when Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon came together to make Rick and Morty, it was Justin Roiland had a bunch of ridiculous jokes about making fun of Back to the Future. And Dan Harmon said, mm -hmm. put them in a house, make them a family, and have it be that if Doc Brown really was your uncle, everyone would feel insecure all the time and it would poison mm -hmm. their relationships, right? Um, so it's like, like, my advice is literally just like, find the human angle. And, and, and if you're running out of human angles, Look for your friends, look for your family. You've got some annoying conspiracy uncle. Okay, great. There's an annoying conspiracy dragon bot who thinks that the war mm -hmm. with the flesh monsters is coming every week and he's kind of a bigot and he has to learn a lesson. Like, I, I don't give a shit about dragon bots, but I would watch that episode. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, everything is just a skin, right? Like, uh, the whatever the show is about, usually it's just about human, human emotion. And, and like you said, like... People are like you're talking about party down, you know, it's just about social interactions. That's all it everything really comes down. Yeah, to. well if the dragon bots are arguing about whether it's okay to double text, I'm gonna sit through the whole episode yeah. because I'm like, yeah. is it okay to double text? I think yeah. I think everyone should double text fearlessly and not count their texts like it's some kind of game, but maybe I'm a fool, That's you know. A... <laughs> yeah. Um I would watch that episode of Dragon Bot. Yeah. Uh amazing. Let's work on that pitch. Yeah. Yeah, I um, am so thankful for all the advice that you're dumping on everyone who's listening to the podcast right now. This is so useful, so great, and really well condensed. Uh, this is like gold. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, I, 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 my problem is I go into this foghorn leghorn mode. Like, I don't mean to be so like fucking like old war stories pedantic and stuff, but like I do, I, I just think about this stuff a lot, you know? I know, and it shows because you're able to explain it in a way that makes sense. And that's like very um, easy, at least for me to understand. I think we've covered a lot of stuff. And honestly, we've already answered a lot of these mm -hmm. questions, which is great. Um, so I think that, uh, I think we're good to wrap it up. Um, what, um, you know, you're working on a show at Netflix. Uh, what other kind of future goals do you have? And is there anything outside of animation that you've been interested in and in trying to make time for, I guess? Yeah. Well, the, the pandemic, the, the pandemic sort of changed everything. I mean, like I, yeah. half of why I create stuff is just to be in a room with a bunch of people that I love and respect and to like learn from them and be friends with them oh, and yeah, huh? to lose the office, um, mm -hmm. is, has been painful for me in ways I can't even articulate. Like I, I really struggled with mental health, uh, over, over the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I think, yeah. you know, I, I talk about how hard show running is. Um, mm -hmm. and sometimes, and I think it's like this in any job, but I think particularly as a showrunner, you know, you wake up in the morning and you, you have a task and let's say your task doesn't go a hundred percent. The little battery inside your heart drains a little bit. And then you go to the next meeting and, oh, something's late and people are stressed about it, a little battery in your heart drains a little bit. And then, you know, you've got to solve a story problem. You've got to solve a, a drawing problem. Ah, I, I hate the way I drew that. Battery drains a little bit. And then you read something bad in the news. Battery drains a little bit. And you're starting to, mm -hmm. you're starting to run. Your HP bar is very low. Come, you know, 3 o'clock. Three but then, you know, oh, 
you hear somebody laughing from the cubicle next to you, you walk in and your friend just did the most hilarious caricature and then, and then your HP bar grows a little bit. And then I go into an art meeting and I see what the art team has done with the background. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. HP bar goes up a little bit. And then, you know, everybody says like, oh my gosh, we're all going to see this latest animated movie that we think sucks, but we're going to try to all enjoy it together and get drunk. HP bar goes up a little bit. Like all those like social moments of like being around people. And then of course, oh, if I do a pitch, gets a bunch of laughs. HP bar goes way up. You know what I mean? Um, if, if there's a big yeah. meeting or, okay, we, we've, we've got it. We've got a, okay, we're doing a Halloween thing around the office. We're doing a party. And now departments that don't see each other are all, all talking, getting to know each other. Boom, 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 goes up. And it's like, you know, because it can be so brutal working in a job like this, and, and particularly if you're in a position of high responsibility, and because you feel that pain so much, you need, you need the thing that raises you up. And for me, the thing that's always raised me up has been how inspired I am just being around and being exposed to and seeing the work of all these amazing artists and actors and, and, and writers and to take that away and have it all be through this tiny little zoom lens, um, you know, yeah. over, over the past you know year and a half, I mean, I, I got just really, really isolated and really depressed, um, you know, because you, you do get trapped. You, you, you're in your little tunnel working, but at least you're often in that tunnel with all these other people. And now it's kind of like going to war alone. You know what I mean? Um, you, like that, that, that foxhole camaraderie is so much harder to create. Um, and so it's, it's definitely made me think differently about everything. Um, like, you know, I'm, I'm working on a, an animated series right now that's very crazy and very ambitious. Um, but it's that, that mm. HP bar of, of all those little things that the office brings, I've had to train myself to mostly live without it or to try to find it in other ways. And it's, it's really challenging, you know, like I, so like, if you had asked me like, oh, what, like, what are my goals and what's my career? And like, what are the things, like, what do I want to accomplish with this new project? And what might I want to accomplish after that? And like, like I would have given you some like big, like obnoxious, like highfalutin TED talk, like a couple of years ago. Like now I'm like, I'm taking it one day at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sounds, yeah. that's, that's relatable. Like we were saying, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm trying um, to make the thing that I'm working on right now as, as good as it yep. can be. And, 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 and try to make sure that uh, I'm maintaining my sanity in this period of transition and isolation and yeah. too much exposure to the internet and, and all those other things that we're all coping with. Oh God. With, yeah. You know? Um, but yeah, I mean the, the project I'm working on right now is, um, uh, Netflix said, uh, you know, what if you could make anything with, with no rules at all? And so I said, well, okay. Um, and, you know, as, as I said before, uh, my challenge with writing block is usually about too many ideas, not about not enough ideas. So the, the development on this has been trying to sort of hone the things that excite me most into a, you know, a very strong, right. clean, dynamic thing. Um, and, you know, I've put together a really incredible team. And, and now my entire mission in life is just to make make what I'm doing live up to the artwork that they're creating because it's it I it's I can't even describe how incredible some of this stuff is um yeah, yeah. but yeah that's that's, that that's the goal did you uh did you pick up any quarantine hobbies um randomly crying at things that aren't tear jerkers <laughs> oh, me too. Yeah, what's, yeah. what's the give us an example well i mean it's like it's like what you know when when you're like just emotionally volatile because the world is falling apart apart around you and then you're just like watching a you know an antihistamine commercial and like somebody's like <laughs> someone's like you know with, with news and x you can say goodbye to mu mucus and then you see the mucus blog like packing his bags and looking sadly over his shoulder and you're like wait wait why are you saying goodbye to mucus yeah he's your friend i mean God, can't you patch it up guys like just like weirdly like whenever i see you know two balloons drifting away from each other i'm like no 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 stay together <laughs> Connections are all we have in this dark void. We need to be around each other. I mean, my, my main hobby I picked up during the pandemic is, and you may have seen this online, I, I, uh, New Year, I threw a giant party, New Year's 2020. I was very optimistic about what 2020 was going to be like. And I filled my brand new house with a bunch of friends. And, uh, you know, we, we rung in the new year and one of my friends got me a bag of sticky hands. Oh, I've seen this. She's like, oh, you have all these big, <laughs> oh, big yeah. high ceilings. Yeah, these high ceilings the wall, in your house. The cursed wall. Why, 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 you know, let's throw sticky hands at your wall. And I'm like, ah, oh, they'll leave a residue. But what the hell? It's New Year's. Let's throw a few on the wall. And then when the pandemic hit, I was like, I'm going to mark the time by throwing a sticky hand on the wall every day, like a prisoner marking notches on their wall. And, you know, yeah. now it looks like this insane Jackson Pollock kaleidoscope clown nightmare. Um, like, 
That's. Are you still going through the bag? Really? Yeah, I'm still going through it. Um, oh my god. I, mean, I no, I, no, I've bought no, I've bought multiple bags since then. Um, okay. But, oh, you've been adding. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, what is... you once you reach the point of no return, you're like, I can't have a wall that's half covered in sticky hands. That would be I crazy. So. That would be crazy. So I need yeah. a wall that's all covered in sticky hands. Let me keep ordering sticky hands like a normal person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's your hobby and now i guess oh my gosh that's it that's amazing i'm glad you know this backstory about the sticky hands yeah it's uh it's becoming an art piece that's yeah. high art let's tie you know what let's bring and it full I, circle I take, that's I, high art. I take it back i i think i've accidentally created art i think by by yeah. by plugging pain it's performance art. yeah well if you just take pain, raw emotion and and you plug it into unconscious intuition then maybe honestly art will so yeah maybe maybe that's the only art i've ever created but i'm fine with that if that's it kind of reminds me of those youtube sh- channel called sitting and smiling and it's this guy uh filming himself for four hours every day uh just sitting and smiling oh god it's it's really interesting there's a one episode where a um he actually like his apartment house gets robbed as he's filming the video but he's Oh he's my so god! He's so committed. He's so committed. Yeah. Holy shit! It was, it's, was it a no, skit? It's actually, was it real? It's, that it's sounds so crazy. Interesting. It's because it's he's so committed because he's actually doing performance art that he's not moving. He's freaking out inside. He talks about it in another video. Oh he's freaking god. out inside, but he's really committed to sitting and smiling. And then the <laughs> you hear in the background, you kind of like see a door, a door like opening, and someone's like hello and they actually get freaked out by him just sitting and smiling so they leave <laughs> it's wow you, you, you know what i don't know what art is but that's definitely yeah art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that's commitment well that's the end of this creative block thanks to alex for being our guest and sharing his story and thanks to your listeners follow us on twitter it's at creative block creative without the vowels where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests Huge thanks to my sister Clemens for editing the podcast. If I said anything, if I said anything controversial, uh, it, it's because of the Nyquil. Um, at Nyquil for anything you don't like that I said. <laughs> yeah, complain to Nyquil. They're the cause of all of this. Uh, if you love our show, then support us on Patreon. Becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews as well as bonus episodes. Click the link in the description of this episode. I've been your host, Gene, and I was B. Keep being creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.